at the very end of Exodus, just the last few verses. So if you can find Leviticus back up just a bit. And we're not going to spend a lot of time in this passage. We're going to just kind of introduce it here and then go everywhere. Talking mainly about places of worship. Brunel was telling me about a book that she helped put together for the 100th anniversary and how difficult it was to get history among members of the churches of Christ, especially stretching back 100 years. And, uh, but it does exist, and if you're interested in it, I believe it's currently in the library. I, I meant to pick it up this afternoon to make sure that I knew exactly where it was. But uh, it is here if you're interested in that kind of study. If you haven't seen it before or if you'd just like to see it again, it's still around here. Uh, what I want us to do tonight is look at places of worship throughout history, and particularly in the Old Testament period. So we're going to go all the way back and start in the Garden of Eden, and we're going to go all the way through the second temple that was destroyed in 70 A.D. Uh, fairly rapidly. I just want to kind of talk about uh, where people in different generations would have identified the presence of God. Where is God? And so for in different time frames, different Old Testament worshipers would have given you perhaps different answers. Go to uh, Exodus 40. We're going to read in verse 26 down to the end of the chapter. Moses placed the golden altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord had commanded him. He put up the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord had commanded him. He placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and he put water in it for washing. Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and their feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting or approached the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. And I can't read that without stopping for a minute and, say, and saying this. Remember, every priest always has to be washed before he can serve as a priest. It's a good baptism sermon. Just put that in the back of your mind. Uh, uh, then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar. And he put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished his work. So uh, several months, lots of contributions from the uh, multitude, Moses overseeing uh, Aholiab and Bezalel doing the main uh, work to get it ready. And so finally the tabernacle was done. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they would not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all of their travels. So imagine being an Israelite. Come sundown, you see the, the glow of the presence of God above the tabernacle. You wake up in the morning and you check out your tent to find out, is God still there? Well, the cloud is still there. If it's down on the tabernacle, we're staying here another day. If it has risen up and gone to the head of the procession, then we're leaving. So for the Israelites who were following God through the desert, he was in that place, specifically in that place. And it was such that even Moses could not enter in when the presence of God was so heavily in that place. All right, so hold on to that one and we'll come back to it in just a little bit. But we're going to start with the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, we start out face to face. Adam and Eve actually have a repertoire with God. He shows up and talks to them. Now the only reason we know that is that they got in trouble. When they ate the fruit, it said the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. And he started looking for them when they were hiding themselves. Now prior to that, we don't have any indication of what kind of relationship they had or how they 
interacted or whether God came every evening to visit with them, just that on that occasion he was there and uh, had to call them to account for eating the fruit. Uh, we don't know how long they had been in the garden. It might have been thousands of years. It might have been a weekend. We have absolutely no way of knowing. And we don't know if worship took any particular form. The word worship, at least our modern word, means to show the worth of. Uh, the Greek word proskuneo meant to fall down in front of. So we don't know whether Adam and Eve ever prostrated themselves before God or uh, went down to their knees when God showed up in the garden. We don't have any of that information, and we don't know how long it lasted. But if you had asked Adam and Eve, where's God? Well, God comes to be with us in the garden in the cool of the evening. Then you move on to Cain and Abel. And again, we don't know exactly how long after uh, Adam and Eve were with God that Cain and Abel made their sacrifices. But out of nowhere, we suddenly have sacrifices. Abel brings a sacrifice of meat. Uh, Cain brings a sacrifice from the fields. Both eventually would be part of the Israelite worship. There were grain offerings and there were meat offerings. God chose Abel's. He was more appreciative of what Abel had brought, and you know that ended up causing Abel's death. Uh, well, God didn't cause Abel's death, but Cain became so angry that he killed his brother. So that sacrifice, and just general sacrifice, seems to have been as far back as time. There was always some sort of worship, but the only place that we could kind of pinpoint is God is wherever we're building the altar. So when Abel built an altar, Cain built an altar, they made sacrifices, the assumption was that God was somewhere close by, that they were worshiping God in that place at that time. Then we get into what we normally call the patriarchal era, and it was the head of the family's responsibility to lead worship. Probably the best example is Abraham, who always, every time he moved, found a, pl a place to build an altar. So all over this land where he was a sojourner in Canaan, everywhere he stopped, he built an altar to the Lord and he made sacrifices. It was so common to Abraham that we come to just expect it. That, you know, Abraham moved from one place to another. What's the next thing he's going to do? Well, he's going to build an altar and he's going to sacrifice to God. So again, we have that understanding that God is kind of following Abraham. Wherever Abraham is, wherever the altar is, then that's where Abraham and God got together. But I have another guy I want to bring up as far as the, the heads of household were concerned because I really like what Job did. Have you ever read uh, through Job? It's, it's kind of long and tedious to read all of the arguments back and forth. Basically, lots of terrible things happen to Job. And he has three friends who come to visit with him. And they argue back and forth for about 35 chapters or so as to why bad things are happening to such a good guy. Job was a nice guy. He was doing the right things. And then bad things started happening. His friend said, the reason is you're a dirty, rotten, low-down sinner. Just admit it. If you'll admit that you're a sinner, then maybe God will let up on you. Maybe he'll decide that you can have some uh, reprieve. And Job kept telling them, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, Job and God were about the only two in that entire uh, book that knew the truth, and the people around him were just confused the whole time. But he kept his integrity, and he never cursed God. But Job chapter 1, I just want to read verses 4 and 5. This has to do with their worship ritual in his family. His sons, he had seven sons and three daughters. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays. They would invite the three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each one of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned or cursed God in their hearts. That was Job's regular custom. Here's a guy that loves his kids. Right? He wants to make sure that they're okay. There's no indication that any of the kids were sacrificing just that Job, as the head of the household, was sacrificing 
on their behalf. And again, the idea that God was wherever the sacrifice was. He was make the sacrifices were being made to God in that place. Uh, ballpark guess, we can start kind of throwing out numbers. Maybe around 2,500 years, give or take. Kelly, you'll tell me I'm wrong later, but that's okay. My, my brother's watching. The, uh, probably around 2,500 years until we get to the tabernacle. It's the heads of households who are responsible. Now, when Moses brings them up out of the land of Egypt, there begins to be a priesthood kind of setting, right? Moses makes those sacrifices setting up the tabernacle. Aaron becomes the high priest. Aaron's sons follow him in the priesthood. Uh, even when you get down to the time of Jesus, you had to be a descendant of Aaron to be in the high priestly category. So there were lots of rules and regulations that came in about the time the tabernacle was built. But for about 2,500 years or so, there was uh, the, uh, the practice of the heads of the household being in charge. And we don't know how many heads of households had direct interaction with God. We have accounts of a couple, Abraham, Job, they both had interactions with God. But we don't know how many others might have. Another kind of interesting example is Melchizedek. He was the priest of God at Jerusalem. It's odd in Abraham's day that there would have been a priest of God at Jerusalem that we didn't know anything about until Abraham meets him and gives him a tenth of what he had. Uh, Melchizedek was worshiping God in a place where Abraham was not, but Abraham also was uh, worshiping in the place where he was. Thank you, sir. Kelly just popped up and said, you are right as usual. Okay, so he's back in my good graces. I don't know about yours. He's a good man. Uh, when, the, when the tabernacle began to be used, for the first 40 years or so, as they're still in the uh, desert, you have that presence of God above the tabernacle. Once you cross over into Canaan, uh, the tabernacle is no longer at the middle of the Israelite camp. Right When they were camping in the desert, there were three tribes on the north, three tribes on the south, three on the east, and three on the west. But once you get into the land of Canaan, then the tribes begin to spread out. And so you don't have everybody at the tabernacle all the time. And the tabernacle moved around a little bit. Uh, it didn't get to Jerusalem uh, for a long, long time. Of course, the Israelites didn't own Jerusalem for a long time. But once David came into power and once he was in Jerusalem, he wanted to start trying to move things toward a permanent dwelling place for God in the capital at Jerusalem. But before that, uh, it was in Gilgal for a little while, and particularly it was in Shiloh. When you read the story of Samuel, all of that stuff takes place at Shiloh. That's where Eli was and where his sons did bad things. Hophni and Phinehas were, were bad priests. But they did all of that at Shiloh. And then eventually the, uh, the whole uh, tabernacle and contents were moved to Jerusalem just in time for Solomon to take over and build a temple, a more permanent dwelling. So if we wanted to put a, a date on how long the tabernacle was, was there, somewhere around 450 to 480 years maybe. Uh, the neat thing about that is it was made out of curtains and hides and cloth, and, one, and but it was kind of in that same category with the Israelites. As long as the Israelites were in the deserts, their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out. Remember that? Right. So the tabernacle is not going to suddenly fall into disrepair uh, because of the elements. God took care of that place. But if you ask an Israelite before the temple was built, where's God? Well, God's at the tabernacle. Right? You, would, you could travel to Shiloh and assume that at Shiloh is where you would come into some kind of uh, contact with God. Uh, our understanding of God and their understanding of God were separate that way. 
When we think about the presence of God, we think about God with us. When they thought about God, they thought about they went to wherever it was physically that God was. Well, then you get to the first temple, Solomon's temple. Uh, at least in part, it was designed and the materials were gathered together by his dad. David wanted desperately to build a house for the Lord. Uh, God said, no, you've got too much blood on your hands. You're not going to be in charge of this. But he allows Solomon to do it. It was roughly twice the size of the tabernacle. It had extra rooms in it. The tabernacle just had the holy place and the holy of holies. The temple had storerooms, uh, places to keep things for the priests who were ministering there. And it was extraordinarily elaborate. So you go from a tent to a place that was built out of cedar and overlaid with gold. So Solomon makes an amazing place for the Lord. But between about, oh, I don't know, uh, 900, uh, let's see, 900, about 870 maybe, Solomon comes in. Uh, between that time and 586 B.C. when the Babylonians come and, and wipe out Jerusalem, if you'd ask anybody in the Israelite camp, Where's God? Well, he's at Jerusalem. He's in the temple that Solomon built for him at Jerusalem. And that's why when you had big festival days that people were required to make that pilgrimage to come to Jerusalem because that's where the priests were. That's where the temple was. That's where they assumed that God was. It remained in use about 380 years uh, and then it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Uh, the reason it was destroyed by the Babylonians is that God was tired of the Israelites saying he was there and worshiping him as if they cared, but turning their hearts away from him. And uh, there, There's a couple of neat passages in Ezekiel where you see the chariot of God come and get him, and he leaves, right, the, the chariot of the Lord shows up at the temple and God basically leaves and leaves them to the Babylonians. Uh, about 50 years later, there's a remnant that comes back to Jerusalem uh, in 536 B.C. And they restore the altar and they clear the foundation and then they go home. And they don't come back and finish rebuilding the temple for about 16 years. Well, the prophet Haggai has the responsibility of reminding them that it's time for them to do something for the Lord and not just for themselves. Look over at Haggai, I think maybe just in chapter 1 is a good place to, to look. If you don't know where Haggai is, go to Matthew and back up 3. Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai. And we'll just start in verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is time for you yourselves to be, or is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruins? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse that has holes in it. This is what the Lord God says. Give careful thought to your ways. Okay. It's time to rebuild the temple. And there were a lot of Old Testament prophets who never got anybody to listen to them. Haggai did pretty good. It didn't take very long at all for the Israelites to kind of mount a comeback and under Zerubbabel to get the temple rebuilt. So the second temple lasts all the way up to 70 A.D., which is somewhere around 500 to 550 years, give or take a few years. Um, the, uh, the temple was interrupted at least on one occasion, the worship was suspended because there was a fellow named Antiochus Epiphanes 
he gave himself the name. Epiphanes means the great one. So Antiochus the great one uh, conquered Jerusalem. And as, as the kings were likely to do, the Greek kings in those days, he wanted to install his God in the place of their God. So he went to the temple and he set up a worship center for Zeus. And he offered sacrifices on the altar that was meant for God. Uh, and he offered at least one pig uh, in tribute to his God. So he completely desecrated the temple. Uh, I know Malcolm really enjoys studying Daniel. One of the things that the angel tells Daniel is that there's going to be an abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation was Antiochus Epiphanes showing up and offering uh, unclean animals on an altar dedicated to Zeus. Well, there's a group of people known as the Maccabees. They were a bunch of priests, and they decided to fight against Antiochus, and they were actually able over the course of about seven years to run him out of town to reestablish the worship of Jehovah at the temple and to continue on from that point. That would have been about... Oh, 160, 150 B.C. Then you start getting into the Herods in Jerusalem. Herod the Great, the one that tried to kill Jesus and didn't get it done when he was a baby. Uh, his son was responsible for killing John the Baptist. Right, That group of Herods. They, their leadership of the Jewish people was sometimes... Uh, laudable and sometimes horrible. But one of the things that the Herods wanted to do, kind of to, to leave a legacy for themselves, was to increase and beautify the temple grounds. So starting with the, the oldest Herod and, and then going down through the lineage, for over 40 years they did rehab to the temple they increased the size of the platform on which the temple sits or sat uh, by several acres. They brought in earth and backfilled to make a larger platform. Uh, they beautified it with gold and with ornamentation. They, they went all out, spent what, what we would say millions of dollars and 40 years to make this beautiful place for the Jews to worship. It's said that as Jews were coming up to worship in Jerusalem that you could see that glowing, beautiful temple from miles away as you were coming up the hill. The Jews sang what they called songs of ascent, songs of going up. As they're going up to the temple, they had songs they would sing together about how beautiful Jerusalem was, what a great God they served, how beautiful the temple was. And then Jesus came and Nationally, uh, at least among their leadership, they rejected him. Uh, the leadership of the Jews put him on a cross. They lied about him. They cursed him. They said, let his blood be on us and our children. And in about 70 A.D., the temple, the second temple, Zerubbabel's temple, was torn all the way down to the ground. It's been almost 2,000 years since there was a temple in Jerusalem. Now I'll tell you, there's still a group of folks in Jerusalem, in, in, in Zion, known as Zionists, who are getting ready to, and at the drop of a hat, will build another temple. They would love to do that. They would love to reinstate sacrifices to the one true God. Can't blame them for wanting to please God. Blame them for rejecting the Messiah. Blame them for not understanding God's plan for the Jewish nation and for all of mankind in Jesus. So they want to put a place back in Jerusalem where you could ask somebody, where is God? Well, he's in that temple at Jerusalem. Here's what Jesus had to say about it. The time is coming and now is that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You know why He said that? 
was talking to the woman at the well, that's what we call her. And she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. And you Jews say we have to go to Jerusalem to worship. In other words, that's where God is. But we say that we can worship here on the mountain. We think God's up here in Samaria. What do you have to say about it? Jesus says, you're asking the wrong question. It's not about a place where God is. It's about how you worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, if you ask a modern-day Christian, where is God? You might get two or three answers. They might say, well, God is everywhere. It's a good answer. He's universal. He's everywhere. They might say, well, God is with us when two or three are gathered together. There Jesus is. There God is in the midst of us. Or they might say, well, the Holy Spirit lives in me. Therefore, God is always wherever I am. God is there with me wherever any other Christian is. God is there with them. So you just look at the history of places that people worship. And I'll I'll plant a seed in your mind and you can think about this later. Maybe tell me a story or two. Just about all of us have a place that when we were there in worship, a church building, a campsite, uh, somebody's home, that there seemed to be a connection between us. You know what I'm saying? That there was more of a a heartfelt connection there, even though we know God's with us all the time, even though we know that he lives with his people, is there a place that you immediately think of when you think, where would I go if I wanted to be in a place where God is? That's an interesting question, I think. And uh, so if you want to share stories with me, that would be cool. Uh, I'll tell you just one. Uh, Since we were talking about this congregation turning 100. The oldest congregation where I've ever preached is in Bald Prairie, Texas. It's down uh, in Robertson County, not too terribly far from Bryan College Station. I was preaching at Franklin at the time, and they were having their 150th anniversary uh, in about 1990-something. They started in, must have been 95. I believe they were established that place of worship in 18. 18- 45. So there are some old, old places of worship that people hold very near and dear to themselves. But uh, if there is there a place that is just kind of that place when you think about worship? But anyway, I'll leave that question with you, leave the lesson with you. If you have any thoughts, holler at me later. Uh, if you have any needs, please let us know as we say. 690.